Well, Dr. Clark again, um, Natural Resource Management. Today I'm going to discuss evolution. Okay? And the reason why we're going to talk about evolution is mainly because all living organisms have the capability to change with changing environments okay? or evolve. And when we talk about natural resources, regardless of whether we're talking about global climate change, um, polluted waters, uh, you know, solar panels going up in the desert, wind turbines going up on a mountainside, a new coal pit, new natural gas well, whatever it is, it has the potential to have an effect on a living organism, us included, okay? but natural organisms in that environment. Okay? So we need to have an understanding of what is the potential um, effect that we could have on these organisms. Are they going to adapt to that environment or do they have the potential to go extinct? Okay? So with that being said, we're going to go through basic evolution. And then we'll talk more about kind of evolutionary ecology okay, and a little bit more about speciation in later lectures. Okay? So first off, let's talk about adaptation. Okay? So we might ask a question like, why do some species live in one place but not another? Okay? And <clears throat> to answer that question, okay, we can take um, into account the adaptations of those organisms. An adaptation is just the acquisition of certain traits that allow a species to survive in certain environments. Okay? For example, something like devil's hole pupfish, which is an extremely endangered species of fish that occurs um, right on the border between Nevada and California. And in this small pool of water okay, called Devil's Hole. This fish is highly adapted to that given region. Okay. In the case where you move that fish out of that water, okay, it doesn't fare very well. Okay. And that means that that organism has adapted for a single environment okay, over you know, potentially millions of years. Okay. Well, with that being said, what happens when we change that environment? What happens when we alter an environment? So I'll talk to you about Devil's Hole later on. Okay. But uh, you know, we can talk about really any environment that we might affect. Is a organism able to adapt to the new environment we provide, or are they going to go extinct? Okay. And we'll talk about this as we progress. Okay. Adaptation is really how Charles Darwin explained his theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Okay. So a little bit about Charles Darwin. Okay. In case you don't know much about Charles Darwin, I'll give you just a brief overview of Charles Darwin. Um, and then we'll... We'll talk about him quite a bit because of his theory of evolution by means of natural selection, theory of evolution by means of sexual selection, okay, artificial selection, and his role in kind of driving evolutionary thought. Okay. So Charles Darwin, born in 1809, died in 1882. He was the son of a physician, so his dad and his grandfather were both physicians. Charles Darwin was set to be a physician. Went to school. He, was, he grew up kind of wealthy. Um, went to school to be a medical doctor. But, you know, if you think about medicine in the mid-1800s, this is before, you know, um, anesthesia. This is before, really, it's before modern medicine, modern medical techniques. Okay, um, and Charles Darwin didn't, he didn't like med school at all. 
He didn't like the screaming. He didn't like the blood. He didn't like um, the brutality or what he felt was brutality of the medical community at the time. Um, and he just, he didn't enjoy it at all. So he dropped out of med school. Okay. The next choice by his father was that he would be a clergyman. And um, Charles Darwin was a self-proclaimed naturalist. He loved nature. He loved going out, sampling things, collecting insects and plants and things like that. Well, going to school to be a religious um, individual, at the time, that's what clergymen did. Okay? They, they would, you know, uh, talk about God and nature and things like that, but on the side, they do experiments, scientific experiments, and name things and, and whatnot. And Charles Darwin loved that piece. Okay? And so Darwin, you know, became a pretty well respected naturalist in his time. Okay? Well, he got in, <clears throat> invited to go on the HMS Be Beagle okay? and go around the world. The HMS Beagles, the purpose was to map the coastlines around the continents so um, you know England could trade with different countries maybe take over different countries okay um, but the coastlines weren't mapped okay and so Darwin went on this big the HMS Beagle to be the naturalist to collect natural specimens and to also be um, kind of a person that uh, the captain of the ship um, could talk to. Okay? And so he was really the first naturalist to suggest an explanation for evolution or why evolution could occur. Often people think that Charles Darwin invented evolution. Okay? Charles Darwin didn't even coin the term evolution. Evolution, that term, uh, you know, dictating change over time um, had been used you know probably hundreds of years before Charles Darwin I mean his grandfather used the term for sure and that's where Darwin got the term evolution from but it had been used a lot okay? Darwin just came up with a mechanism by which it can occur okay? and so he published in 1859 that mechanism by which evolution can occur and his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection was published in 59. Okay. Here's the book, Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species. Um, if you're going into science, if you're going to be um, a biologist, I highly recommend reading it. It is, you know, um, extremely important to the field of science, to the field of biology especially. But if you're not going okay, and you want just a nighttime read that's guaranteed to put you to sleep, read Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species. Okay? It's a sleeper. Okay? Um, a far better book, far more interesting book, um, is Charles Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle. Okay? I'll put the link to both. The Voyage of the Beagle talks about his interactions with tribes, talks about his time on the boat, his time in the Galapagos. Um, it's a much better read, much more interesting, and will not put you to sleep. Okay? I'll put the link for both underneath. Okay? So Charles Darwin's work and um, publication really challenged the established views of the world in the 1850s and in some parts of the world even today it still challenges okay, people's beliefs. Okay? At the time in the 1800s it was thought that all species were created by a super, superior being and that no species could change. Okay? So Jar Darwin was proposing this mechanism suggesting hey this is how species can change and that is the mechanism is natural selection he also came up with the mechanism of sexual selection and um, it was already known but he kind of coined the term artificial selection okay? people had been breeding dogs and horses and cattle and 
pigeons and all kinds of things prior to Darwin's time. So they knew that artificial selection worked. They knew that they could um, alter physical characteristics of organisms by selecting what two organisms to breed together. Okay. <clears throat> now, after a lot of experiments, so Darwin uh, went on the voyage of the Beagle in 1820 and didn't publish until well 1822 but didn't publish until 1859 okay so he sat on his findings from the voyage of the beagle but also from other experiments that he did um, for a long period of time okay he had 20 almost 30 years of experimental evidence okay, that he presented in his book on natural selection okay and so from then, though, after he presented it, a lot of researchers got into experimenting and finding out, is evolution a valid hypothesis? Okay? And after massive amounts of testing, okay, evolution became a theory, um, not a hypothesis, especially natural selection. Okay? So again, um, the voyage of the beagle, um, 1831 to 1836. Okay, uh, again, um, Darwin was 22 years old okay, when he went on the voyage of the Beagle. Um, he wasn't the first choice for the naturalists on the voyage of the Beagle. Okay? Most people turned down um, Fitzroy because they knew that it was going to be a long trip. Fitzroy claimed that. Um, the trip would only be a two-year trip, and okay? but most naturalists already knew that that was not the case. Okay, Darwin was naive; he was young, okay, and joined the team, and it was five years, not two years. Okay, okay? but Darwin's role was really to observe the plants and the animals and the geology, and he did so. He was an avid collector; he collected thousands of s samples and specimens on his time on the the Beagle. Okay? And what this allowed for him to do is by seeing different organisms in different habitats, he was able to compare okay, how does this species look in kind of a tropical habitat and then outside of that in the grassland habitat is there a similar species. Okay? And he saw a lot of this evidence when he went to the Galapagos because from island to island, he would see different organisms. They're just barely different, okay? But they had a little bit of a different role. For example, the Galapagos tortoises. Darwin claimed that he could tell what island the tortoises were from based on the shape of the tortoise shell. If they're from a dry island, the tortoise had to reach up and take vegetation that was higher up. So they would have a saddle, and they called them saddleback tortoises. Okay, so they, their shell was kind of in a saddle form. If they're from a water or a wet island, they ate from the ground more, and they they didn't have that saddle any longer. Okay, and so Darwin, through these observations, he really could um, tell a lot about where the organism was from and probably what the organism was feeding on, especially with the Galapagos finches. So here you can see that five-year voyage on the HMS Beagle. Okay, so going around. Um, so the interesting piece is, you know, Fitzroy said that um, it would take them two years to do the whole thing. Okay, by the time they made it to the Galapagos, it had already been three years. Okay, by the time they made it to the Cape, it had already been two years. They had a lot of stops um, along, you know the coast of South America, uh, a lot of interactions with tribes, a lot of time spent in the tropical forests, okay? and it was really, you know, it's interesting, most of Darwin's work is famous for the Galapagos Islands, but he only stayed about 30 days in the Galapagos Islands, and he didn't even make it to all the islands. Um, so, you know, most of his evidence really comes from South America. Okay? Because after the Galapagos Islands, there's very few stops, okay? and most of the 
the area here um, was not even mapped. Okay, so they didn't even really map Madagascar um, or anything. You know, Australia wasn't really mapped. New Zealand was missed. Okay, Indonesia or in the Philippines, they were all missed um, because the trip was just taking too long. Um, and so a lot of other uh, evolutionary evidence came out of, you know, the Philippines um, and Indonesia by... Uh, um, Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace, um, who came up with the theory of evolution by means of natural selection at pretty much the same time that Charles Darwin did. So where did Darwin's evidence come from? Um, Darwin noticed, and many people before Darwin noticed, that species had the ability to change. They were not fixed. Okay? And his evidence really came from fossils and extinct organisms resembling those of living organisms. Uh, he writes a lot about this in um, The Voyage of the Beagle. He talks about time spent along streams and looking across the stream and seeing, um, you know, ancient fossilized giant um, armadillo-like organisms and then on top of that, you know, running along the bank is a modern armadillo. Okay? And so a lot of his evidence came from these extinct organisms resembling living organisms. Okay? He also looked at geographic patterns. Okay? So not just island information, but also information from moving from tropical forest to grassland to desert and then how did organisms adapt to these different environments. Okay. And then finally the islands really gave him a huge amount of evidence that species were not fixed but had the ability to change over time. So here you can see Glophodont okay, and Armadillo and he would see these ancient you know giant armadillo like organisms in fossil form and then these living armadillos you know near them next to them same thing with giant ground sloths he found fossils of giant ground sloths in the same region where he found living fall uh, living sloths okay and so the evidence for evolution um, started piling up okay? the Galapagos finches um, also showed him a lots of evidence you now Darwin thought these were all different types of birds like the cactus finch he thought was a woodpecker okay and the woodpecker finch he thought was a warbler and um, thought the vegetarian finches were sparrows okay and then he you know he, he thought that the ground finches were true finches okay so when he sent specimens of all these he shot all these birds and packed them up and sent specimens back okay when he sent specimens back and got back, okay, he gave it to bird specialists and they told him, look, these are all finches. Okay? So they all are the same group, but they are adapted to eat different sources of foods. Okay? And he coined this okay, descent with modification because Darwin had seen ancestral finches on the mainland. Okay? And so he suggested that somehow the ancestral finch was blown out to the Galapagos Islands okay? and those that were adapted enough to live on those islands survived and over millions of years adapted to only feed on certain things like cactuses or insects or small vegetation or seeds okay? and that's where the term descent with modification came about as he realized that there's an ancestor and then all of its descendants. Okay. So that kind of brings me to evolution. Just the general kind of terminology of evolution that we now know it as. Okay. So traits that evolve have to be inherited. So genetically there has to be a, a component for that trait. Okay. Now realize this, when Darwin came up with his theory of evolution by means of natural selection, genes, DNA, chromosomes, 
all that we didn't know. He didn't know. Right? Uh, it wasn't discovered until the 1900s that um, DNA really even existed. It was hypothesized, but we didn't have the capability of really discovering that. And it wasn't until the 1940s that we knew the structure of DNA, therefore we know genes and how it's inherited and things like that. So Darwin created a hypothesis about something that we didn't even know existed. Okay? It's a pretty big deal. Okay? So, But we now know that evolution is nothing more than genetic change over time. Natural selection is a process by which that can occur. Okay? So individuals that are genetically better suited for the current environment will pass those traits on to the next generation and their offspring are better suited for that environment than other offspring. So where does the difference come from? This is based on Mendelian information, but again, Mendel didn't even know this. Okay? Mendel assumed that there was some kind of component inside an organism that would dictate what it looked like okay? and would dictate what's being passed on to its offspring. But he didn't know what it was. He didn't know it was DNA. Okay? But he did know that mutations or changes in that DNA could happen. Now we know so much that we know ways at which the DNA can be changed by either mistakes in replication, exposure to radiation, UV rays, different types of toxins, uh, different environmental components can change the DNA. Okay? And as we progress, we know more and more about DNA and we know where the differences can come for um, natural selection. Okay. So more evidence from evolution can come from fossils. Okay. Um, the nice thing or the interesting thing about fossils is they're independent data points. Okay. So one fossil has no effect on another fossil okay, because it's just rock. Okay. But because of Madam Curry's invention of or discovery of radioisotopes, okay, we now know that we can date the rocks, we can date the fossils, so we can figure out when that organism, approximately when that organism died, okay, and if there's a fossil laid here and then a fossil on top of it, okay, we know that the fossil that comes first is older than the next fossil, and on and on and on, and we can look at evolutionary history. So this gives us an idea of successive change throughout time, okay? which gives us a lot of evidence for macroevolution, large changes, going from fish to amphibian. Okay? We know that we have fossils like Tiktaalik, which is half fish, half amphibian. Okay? Going from dinosaur to bird, we have fossils like Arctopteryx. Okay, which is half dinosaur, half bird, okay? and on and on and on. We have these transition fossils, which shows this macroevolution, these large changes. Okay. And even more than that, okay, we can look at an organism okay, over a period of time. So we can take these Tianothors, and we can look at them as they change through time. Okay. Now, Interestingly, not only is the fossil of you know, this organism okay, available, but the environment that the organism lived in is also available, available in the fossil record. So if we look at you know, this mammal here, okay, same mammal, just changing over time. It's not the same species, but probably the same genera changing over time. Okay? So if you look at this species here, okay, small, um, extremely sh fast, streamlined, okay, it, it evolved in a forested habitat. And as the landscape changes and there's less trees and less forests, and we start to see this environment become more savanna, 
the organism gets bigger, slower, more robust, has more projections on its um, head to fight off predators, okay? and we can see this transition over you know millions of years in the same environment, same habitat, same area. Well, sorry, not same habitat, same environment just changing over time, same area on the globe. Okay? The other things that Darwin pointed out, okay, is the anatomic record, okay, and so this is an example of, you know, embryos, vertebrate embryos, and the features that they shared. Darwin did a lot of dissections, okay, and he pulled embryos at different stages. And if you look at embryo development early on in em embryo development, okay, all embryos have pharyngeal pouches, okay areas where um, gills would evolve or gills would develop. Okay? All organisms have these pouches. Okay? All organisms also have tails. Okay? And it's just that over time, okay, reptiles don't have gills, okay? birds don't have gills, humans don't have gills. Okay? These pharyngeal pouches go away. Okay? And Reptiles have tails, but birds don't, okay? And humans don't have tails, okay? So the coccyx will fuse together into a tailbone. Birds have a similar um, structure, okay, that would fuse together, okay? But reptiles keep their tails. And Darwin noticed this. And so the an anatomical records showing that organisms, okay, in the embryonic stage are very similar to each other. Okay? We now know, because of genetic advances, we know what genes turn on and what genes turn off to develop these pharyngeal pouches, to have them go away or to have the tail become fused. Um, we understand, you know, the genetics behind it to show that indeed everything is related. More evidence from evolution comes in homologous structures or the same bone. Um, in different species and what uh, that bone shows or what feature that bone looks like in a different species okay? or analogous structures organisms that aren't related to each other at all but having very similar structures okay for example okay? <clears throat> so sorry um, analogous structures one of the key components of those is what we call convergent evolution. It, there are certain features and certain body types of organisms that work. It seems to work for that environment. Okay? So the ability to fly, okay? flight. All organisms that can fly have wings. Now how the wing develops is very different. Okay? And not organisms Organisms with wings are not related to each other, not all of them. So bats are not really related to birds. Okay? There's a lot of individuals in between that couldn't fly, didn't have the ability to fly at all. Okay? But when you look at a bat, it has wings, okay? but its wings are developed from webbing between fingers. When you look at a bird, it also has wings. Okay? but doesn't have any fingers and it's just a fused kind of joint okay, with feathers attached to it. Okay? And so these are called convergent evolution. Okay? They converge on the same kind of body type but the organisms aren't related to each other. Okay? So here you can see homologous structures. Same bone, humerus, radius, ulna, okay, phalanges in all these organisms. Bats, they have elongated fingers, but they have the same bones, humans, same bone, horse, same bones, por um, a porpoise, okay, the same bone structure, and really we can look at all vertebrates, and you can see these bone for bone matches. Now, what's been fused, and how are they used, and how big are they, they differ, okay, but the bone itself is the same. Convergent evolution, okay, similar kind of structures, from the outside when you look at them, but how they're actually designed, how are they developed, okay, are very different. 
So the fact that you can take like the Tasmanian wolf and you know a New World wolf, okay? and they have the same kind of features, they have the same pack mentality, everything like that. But a Tasmanian wolf is a marsupial; they have a pouch, okay? and you know modern wolves don't. Okay? They're a placenta animal and and give um, birth to a live individual that is self-sustaining or nearly self-sustaining. We'll come back to these um, later when we look at how environmental change might drive some of these features to change. Okay. More evidence of evolution, stuff that Darwin didn't know about, but now provides probably the most evidence for evolution, and that comes from the molecular level, or actual DNA or molecule changes. Okay. And we can trace these over time. Okay? And it can give us a lot of um, historical evidence for what organisms are related to what organisms. Okay? And how closely are relate, is that relation? And why, potentially why, why did an organism develop a new trait? Why are they more adaptive to a different environment? Okay? And so even though we can see divergence in physical features, it, sometimes it's a lot easier to see the divergence or the changes in molecular features in protein level because proteins have the capability of changing faster than full-size body parts which might be made up of hundreds if not thousands of different proteins. Okay? So here's an, a good example of this. Okay? Lampreys are the first organism, or very prehistoric fish, okay, that has hemoglobin molecules. Okay, so hemoglobin is that protein that allows for oxygen to bind up to it, and it carries, you know, our red blood cells and all other organisms on this list. Okay, so every vertebrate has red blood cells that have hemoglobin, have the capability of carrying oxygen and CO2. Okay, so lamprey are kind of the bottom organism, the vertebrate that kind of first developed that. Okay? And if we look at the number of different amino acids okay, between these different species and humans, it gets an idea of when we were last connected to that organism. So you see human hemoglobin versus lamprey, there's been 125 differences. Okay. Frog 67, bird 45, dog 32, macaque monkeys 8. Okay? What's not shown here is if we show chimpanzee, there's zero changes. Okay? They're the same. So over evolutionary time, you would expect organisms that we are saying are close, more closely related to us, or maybe you're looking at anything, they would have less changes in amino acids. They'd have less of a difference. Okay? We can look at this across many organisms too, okay? and try to get an idea of when was the when were those two organisms last connected. Okay? And to do this, we have to use something that occurs in a constant rate. Okay? So there are certain genes that we know about that mutate or change over kind of a constant period of time. Okay? And if you have and utilize a gene that changes over a constant period of time, you can do something called molecular clocking, which means that we can put not just how many differences are there between two species, but how long ago did they have the same molecule, the same protein. Okay, So how long have they diverged? How long have they been separate from each other? Okay. And so we can use examples of things that all organisms have that have the capability of going through like the electron transport chain. Okay, And we'll get to this. This is part of the cellular respiration. We'll talk about cellular respiration in much more detail. But there's a protein in uh, organisms called cytochrome C, okay, which allows for electrons to be utilized 
to drive work to form ATP. Okay? And we know that the cytochrome C gene, okay, it changes at a constant rate. So when we look at something like this, here's just an example, okay, comparing humans to different things, other organisms to different things, okay, and you can see that we have on the x-axis how many million years ago was there a difference between these organisms. Okay? So let's take something that didn't evolve even close to each other, like humans and kangaroos. Okay? So humans and kangaroos haven't had a similar cytochrome C complex or similar, similar cytochrome C um, protein for about 125 million years. Now, on top of that, we can start looking at other evidence, other pieces of evidence. Like, when was Australia, where kangaroos evolved, okay, when was it last attached to Africa or India? Okay? And when we look at the evidence in the geological record, okay, it suggests that Australia broke away from um, Pangaea at about 140, 150 million years ago. Okay? And that provides pretty good evidence here that the last time kangaroos and humans would have shared anything that looked the same based on cytochrome C would be somewhere in that 100 million year range. Okay? Now, keep this in mind. Kangaroos are not 100 million years old. Neither are humans. Okay? Humans are about 4 million, maybe 5 million years old. Okay? But our cytochrome C, the, the protein that we share with our ancestors and their ancestors and on and on and on, okay? this was the last time we shared similar cytochrome C with kangaroos about 125 million years ago. Okay? We can work on the, all the way down to something like a horse and a donkey. Okay? You know that if you mix a horse and a donkey together, you get a mule, and it's sterile. That would suggest that a horse and donkey are two separate species. They cannot produce viable offspring. Yet, the last time they shared a cytochrome C molecule was eh, maybe two million years ago. Okay? So two million years ago, a horse and a donkey, their ancestors, were the same. They had the same cytochrome C gene. So it shows this connection between horses and donkeys, which we already know because they can mate together. They don't produce viable offspring, but they can mate together, and they will mate, okay? um, which, you know, really suggests, hey, you know, they're closely related. Okay? So the evidence for evolution that we now possess okay, through DNA analysis, through protein analysis, through you know, molecular techniques is much greater than what Charles Darwin had in the 1850s, okay, what Mendel, Mendel, Gregor Mendel had in the 1850s, 1860s, okay, even what Watson and Crick had when they came up with the structure of DNA Okay, in the 1940s. We are now, with our advancements in technology, we now have the capability to not only look at how closely related are organisms based on just a single protein, but we now have the capability of altering that protein and allowing for it to drive work, to do things for us. Okay? And so, in future lectures, we're going to talk about genetically modified organisms and what that might do to the evolution of organisms or what, how that might play in advancing human societies. Okay? So next time we're going to talk about evolutionary ecology, so forces in the environment that can change the genetics of an organism. Okay? And then we'll talk about speciation and a couple other events that have to do with evolution.